going to have a little run through what we've been up to in careers. And um, for those who are familiar <coughs> with how career services are set up, the IAG bubble, information, advice and guidance, the three pillars and founding pillars of any career service. So the advisors in the room will recognise that bubble. Um, and so you can see we have a whole range of activity. Um, some that's really driven around just providing information and resource development, some that's more outreach, um, getting out, um, um, supporting, giving advice through education um, and events, and then of course one-to-one -one guidance. So Rachel's going to join us now. Rachel's going to give us a quick run through the scores on the doors um, for some of this, this activity, actually what we've been doing and how much of it we've been doing. Um, we were quite surprised when we called this together. Yes, that. Okay. Right, okay. Uh, we're going to just go through the education and the events that we've been doing over the past year, uh, which is quite significant. It's not until, like we say, we do a date and we realise how much we've actually done. Uh, so, for over since the first of April last year up until today's date, then uh, we've done 41 careers education um, interventions. And what that means, it could be an education workshop, it could be um, a sort of a drop-in session or a kind of event. Or a um, lecture. Or a lecture. Or getting pressure like lectures in year five, yeah. Um, but in total, we've seen 730 people in those 41 interventions. That could be trained doctors, consultants, um, education providers, careers advisors. So we've seen lots of people during that year. Um, and again, you know, our education in terms of lectures or face-to-face -face, uh, workshops. Uh, we do lots of in the early years, so the Foundation Year 1 and Foundation Year 2. Uh, and it's easier to do, to do the F1 there, so they do have compulsory and um, protected teaching time throughout the year. Um, so lots of our work is in the early stages, but that's when they need it, we think, anyway, from based you know, from previous research, is that they need this um, advice at an early stage. Um, as you can see, we, we don't do much with core trainees at the moment, we have zero on the stats, um, but we are hopefully going to look over at that figure in the next year to see how we can, what type of advice they need. And you'll see um, where they show up through later talks this morning, yeah. so they tend to show up in a different way. Yeah. Um, ST3 uh, plus, uh, they, that's when they get into this special training and sometimes we may see people who were want to change specialty, maybe leave the profession. Um, so we do some work with them, and we also do some work with them how to prepare for a consultant interview. And that 72 there is where we've seen people get them ready for the interview. Um, and then faculty, we've, um, Sally does the faculty work, um, and we've seen 70 um, encounters over the last year. And that's mainly through those two through sessions at the bottom, yeah. and occasionally things we contribute to. We do one uh, workshop in F1, we start to get them thinking about careers, what specialties are available to them. When they're in F2, we do two workshops with them. One is about getting them ready for the um, specialty interview, um, and we do another workshop with awareness and how to go about that. We do some <coughs> interview practice with them as well, which is what we need. Um, and Sally does um, some mentoring workshops and supporting doctors with careers as well. Okay, so we are to the events. Um, so this is over the last year as well. So we've seen 26 um, careers events. Um, and we do cover the length and breadth of Wales. And we do cover some national events when we find as well. Um, and as you see the numbers there, uh, we do lots with medical schools, both in Swansea and Cardiff. Um, and this year, uh, we've also the Cardiff Vale Health Board and um, Howard Flower Health Board are hosting their own postgraduate career fairs. So I think that um, means we've got so coverage in every health board. We have. Now, that's the first time. Yeah, we have coverage in every health board. And although they're not high profile events, they're really key in trying to retain the trainees who have already got to Wales. I think that's, we think that's really important that we're trying to keep hold of those people and we've spent a lot of money on trying to train them up and hopefully try and keep them as much as we can. <coughs> uh, again, we do lots of uh, specialty events as well, special showcase events. And Carlton Vale have got one in the, the end of April, so we'll be there promoting the specialties again and the deanery. Um, and we'll do lots of external events as well. They tend to be more high profile events where we can promote Wales as, as a region. Um, so it's really the Welsh Government and the Dean of the NHS attended the BJ Career Fair London last year. 
I'm going to be able to talk a little bit more about that um, after. Um, but what we'd like you, if, if you do know of any community events taking place over the next year, we'd like you just to tell us about them and whether or not we would be there to attend with the deanery or whether we can add it onto our deanery website if we have a community events page. We've also linked up with Health Education England to have a national careers fair, careers um, web page, yeah. and we can add your events on there for you, so they can have a national presence on their website as well, okay? Um, okay, so that's the education events. Now we're on to resource developers. We've been, over the last year, we've been updated and got quite a few of our handouts, and that's in terms of anything to do with medical CVs, application forms, specialties for applications, and all of this information is the information we take to career affairs, we add on our website. So the information to help trainees make that, you know, important application and career awareness. We've also got Welsh versions available now, with most of them. Uh, so obviously we're trying to be as bilingual as possible as part of our university strategy. So we run um, the thing there. Uh, we've also been working on um, specialty leaflets. Uh, over the past year in the communications office and um, we, we will soon have an updated um, copy by the end of the month um, and all those will be available again as resources for trainings um, on the website. Uh, we are trying to produce more virtual um, resources over the next year um, looking at our target audience on the, the different images coming up through the system now. Uh, so we will be thinking about developing some maybe webcasts and online question and answer forums. We're probably going to have to do a few panelists first with the, uh, with the foundation doctors. Um, but yes, I mean, hopefully we can link up with you guys to, uh, to get some collaborative work going on in that. Um, we're also, oh, yeah, that's it, and that's it. And that's our website there, our careers website. That all the information is on there. Um, we've got, it's split into four different sections. We've got exploring and planning, jobs and applications, careers guidance, information for trainers, and an events page as well. Oh, we just over. Okay, so that's just a whistle stop tour. I'm going to hand you back to Sally. Well, we'll we'll stop stop the trainees that come to see us one of one, <laughs> 26 over the last year, which is about right. We'll have you know, normally about sort of three to four trainees a month who come um, and want sort of more detailed help with one-to-one with -one, um, issues. And what this tells us here is we don't have so many in foundation, um, but we do see a lot of core and higher trainees. So this is where they present. Yeah, um, so that kind of fills the gap in the middle, and also GP. We've seen quite a few GP trainees. That's normally related to coming to the end of GP and issues with progression and what happens if I don't get through my exams. Yeah, um, they, that, and that becomes quite interesting because if you look at the reasons people come to see us, by far the main reason is changing pathway. Yeah, um, and. Um, that's often the reason for the GPs, Mary, I'm looking at you here, is often, what do I do, what do I do instead? Yeah. Um, but interestingly, some of the people who, who are not GPs, that are looking at changing the pathway, often heading towards GP. We had two confirmations yesterday that two offers have been accepted from someone in there. <laughs> so that's, that's good, you know, that's, that's no way of putting people in there. So, um, and progress issues. Uh, sometimes it is getting in, sometimes it's it's leaving training, that's not leaving the profession, that's perhaps about to move from training to a non-training pathway, but still to pursue a medical career. <coughs> Very occasionally someone really um, does worry about all of it. So those are the main reasons that people come and see us. And so we, are, we see ourselves as being part of a, a large framework where we're sort of close to the top of that pyramid, yeah? But really a lot of the work, the guidance work, is happening at the bottom end of the world of you. Um, out here, either at grassroots as educational supervisors, as in medical education, or those with the more enhanced roles like local faculty leads for training support or our career leads, um, all have a part to play in that picture of, of advice and guidance. And we will help you too. Some of the things we're bumping up against at the moment, some of the current topics of interest, certainly from undergrad, a lot of discussion about how we can promote medical school more widely, and I think our colleagues from and many will we'll talk about that. Trainees are also grappling with the interest in quality improvement and leadership 
and um, how do I evidence that in my portfolio? And that can be quite a challenge earlier on in training when there's a perception that, oh, I haven't got much chance of doing that stuff, so how do I generate the evidence that everybody now wants me to have in my portfolio? There's a lot of interest in movement between training and non-training. You know, if I were to step out for a bit, um, it's very easy to step out, but why does it have to be so hard to step back? Yeah, and so there's a kind of voice in the community about can, can that movement bounce between pathways be made a bit more easy. Um, and trainees are catching on to um, the possibility of transferring competencies between programmes if they change training programmes, because now some programmes will accept competencies from other programmes. I'm thinking GP again, Mary, where you accept a <coughs> number of, of sources now, and that can reduce the, the length of the second programme by six months. Um, and we know it's out there, but actually, talking one-on-one, -on -one, doesn't seem that all trainees are aware that, that that could be an option. So I think that's something we need to focus on. Um, I'm going to run very, very quickly through the big hot topic, which is what's everybody doing after F2? And where are they all going? And are, are they all in Australia? Um, and we know they're not because they have the jobs there, you know, um, at, 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 at that level. You know, the ones that emigrate tend to be further up, more established. Um, but this, the, the key report you're uh, directed to here is full of fascinating numbers, but do read it all and do read the small print, because there's a bigger story in here. Um, but annually, the Foundation Programme ask everybody as they're leaving F2, what are you doing next? And that's immediately next. It's not next and for all time. What's the next thing I'm going to do in August, you know, when I'm not in a Foundation Programme? So they, it's not necessarily for the whole year. Um, but the next thing, um, increasingly, we found that less and less of that is going straight into specialty training. And in the careers world, we've been seeing this over time, haven't we? We've, we you know, we've known this. Um, but I think for the first time, it is now 50-50 split. So 50% of F2 is nationally going to, F2, uh, going to specialty, 50% don't. And in Wales, it's slightly smaller than that. And I think a bit less again in seven. Yeah, so you've got even fewer than us and even more going abroad. You know, it's interesting. But our going abroad wedge is actually quite um, quite small. Um, the, one of the largest wedges for us is just taking a break. Um, and this is backed up. Um, I have permission from the GMC to share it with their slides because they're looking at this as well. Um, and this is what doctors doctors reporting to the GMC. It's not quite the same sample, so it's a smaller sample. Um, but about a third are, are trying to work outside the UK. Um, but about the same number are either wanting to obtain a service post or just to take a break. But interestingly, the GMC have asked some questions about why. Uh, we do know quite a lot about why uh, this decision, but I think this nails it quite nicely. Um, it's about just wanting to chill for a bit. It's a work-life balance step. I just want to stop for a bit. Um, and, um, and what we hear a lot is, I, I, I just need a bit more time before I choose what I want to do for the next 40 years. I want to try something out. I want to do rotation in something I couldn't do. Um, there wasn't time in my foundation program. Um, but this is interesting. Some, um, um, the third reason, working in a foundation program has led to burnout. So actually, there's some insights there into how um, that experience of being a junior doctor is perceived. But if you look at the year this happened, it was the year of junior doctors dispute. And there was quite a lot of narrative about how hard being a junior doctor is. So that's kind of the interesting thing to report there. But anyway, um, it's a phenomena. Services are looking at how they can respond. A lot of people are looking at the question. I guess when you look at this with a careers lens, a career support lens, rather than a workforce lens or a retention lens, um, it is something we didn't expect to be dealing with in, in this scale. We thought our job would be seeing trainees through specialty choices and through processes into um, into training, but now this is bringing up um, a different need. Um, the good news is, if you worry about the ones that go abroad, the GMC data tells us that they do come back within a year or two. Okay? Um, so they're not all um, exiting. What we've done at the moment, we keep in touch with our F2 doctors. Um, we offer a keep in touch group. We've got a, a closed Facebook group so that people who are abroad can, can network um, with us and still keep in the loop on. Um, information on how to get back, I and mean, Rachel has assembled a group um, of successful returners, actors, mentors, peers, a resource to help us develop more 